when I stepped out into the bright sunlight from the, the darkness of the movie house. I had only two things on my mind. Paul Newman and a ride home. Upon the moment long ago. I don't know about you, but The Outsiders by Essie Hinton was required reading when I was in middle school. And looking back, it's the kind of English class fodder that would make any young person really take a look at the world and see that people are alike all over. In The Outsiders, there are two worlds, that of the greasers, the poor, disenfranchised group who are so-called because of the state of their hair, seemingly forever cursed to a life of menial labor and unfair treatment by police, and the Soches, their well-off counterparts who get the nicest houses, cars, clothes, and opportunities. Hinton's novel is a coming-of-age story narrated by Ponyboy Curtis. Ponyboy is 14 years old at the start of the novel and has skipped a grade, making him one of the younger students at his high school. Ponyboy is intelligent, but hardly uses common sense, much to the annoyance of his oldest brother Daryl, who was granted custody of Ponyboy when their parents died. The other resident of the household is Soda Pop Curtis, the middle child, and also the most good-looking. Daryl works on roofs in the community, and Soda works at a local auto repair shop and has recently dropped out of school, because as he puts it, he's dumb. There are other characters too, specifically Johnny Cade, the one in the group closest to Pony's age who often sleeps in an abandoned lot to escape his abusive home life and Dallas Winston, a juvenile delinquent who was recently released from juvie on good behavior. After a lethal run-in with a Soch, Johnny and Ponyboy run away to escape the law, only to re-enter the spotlight when they save some schoolchildren from a burning church. The boys are heroes, despite their social standing. Before stories end, both Johnny and Dallas die, one due to injuries sustained by the fire, and the other from getting shot by police following a mental breakdown. Ponyboy writes about these proceedings, and we find the novel is a composition he had written for his English class, ending it as it had begun. It is a wonderful book, penned by the then 16-year-old Hinton. It is written with the pathos and wisdom of someone well beyond her years, and gives readers a glimpse into a world that, as fictional as it can seem, was very real for many. I grew up in a greaser neighborhood, and I was a tomboy, most of my friends were guys. And, uh, but I, when I went to high school, I got put in what would be called AP classes uh -huh. now, but it was college track. So I had, you know, I knew a lot of what would be called the socials too. They were in there. And one day when a friend of mine got beaten up on his way home from school, I began a short story that began as a boy getting beaten up on his way home from the movie. And it turned out to be this. It turned out to be that. Wow. The characters are given chances to defy and subvert expectations set upon them by society, but many play into stereotypes. It is the ones that blur the lines that stand out the most. Ponyboy is mostly a bystander in the proceedings, with Dallas and a social named Cherry Valance giving us the shades of grey. Both can be seen as victims of their circumstances, but Dallas goes out of his way to save the kids from the church. Cherry, a young woman from the other side of town, acts as a mediator between the socials and the greasers, and is ultimately one of Ponyboy's only allies when he returns to school. These flecks of grey in the overall situation create a robust reading experience that makes a person think about their incredibly acute worldview. And, of course, it was such a phenomenon that was a film adaptation. I bet they're looking for us. This is our territory. I wish that you could concentrate on something else just once in a while. What's your name? Pony Boy Curtis. Released in 1983, Francis Ford Coppola directed the one and only version of The Outsiders. Receiving mostly positive reviews, especially for Ralph Macchio as Johnny, the film stands as a pop culture staple. We all know the quote, stay gold, pony boy, which is debatably what the film is most famous for. The movie also stars a slew of actors who would be defined by their roles throughout the 1980s, such as C. Thomas Howell, Ralph Macchio, Patrick Swayze, Rob Lowe, Tom Cruise, Emilio Estevez, and Matt Dillon. It's such a stacked film that it's crazy to even think that almost none of these young men were yet household names. We look back on it now and think, Jesus Christ, that's Rob Lowe standing there in that towel. And please move so I can see Rob Lowe step out of that shower. And 
God damn it, I miss Rob Lowe stepping out of that shower. Boy, I really hope somebody got fired for that blunder. Personally, the film version was one of those early examples of media that helped me realize and shape my sexuality. It really is a homoerotic film when you look at it. The way the young men are filmed, their extremely close relationships, the sheer amount of emotion displayed by them all. There's a particularly moving scene toward the end where Soda asks Daryl and Pony to stop fighting that cements the extremely giving and empathetic role the brothers play in each other's lives. Pony and Johnny also cry when they initially run away. Daryl hugs Pony when they reunite. In all, the greasers are there for each other, form bonds that resemble that of a found family, and it's all truly heartwarming. The score, too, by Coppola's father, Carmine Coppola, does a lot to help the tone of the film. The song Stay Gold sets up a tender mood that gives the audience a sense of nostalgia. One breath away and there you will be so young and carefree again you will see that place in time so gold and instrumental versions of the song occasionally creep back in when there's an especially poignant moment the cue titled sunrise is played when two characters are gaining a new perspective on a situation first when pony boy recites a robert frost poem to johnny so eden say to grief. So dawn goes down today. Nothing gold can stay. Where'd you learn that? That's what I meant. And then again when Pony tells Cherry that everyone sees the same sunset. Can you see the sunset from the south side very good? Yeah, real good. You can see it from the north side too. I prefer listening to the original release of the score, not the remastered version. There's something about the smoothness of the original where the instruments blend together more that my ears enjoy. Side tangent? The complete novel version of the movie replaces and rearranges much of Coppola's music and, in my opinion, really ruins the effect that it had. Francis axes the score for a contemporary soundtrack that at times enhances the mood but also creates a mood that's different from what I think he intended. Instead of a drama rife with coming-of-age goodness, the film, with the 50s hits of yesteryear, reads more like an American graffiti ripoff. Also kind of disgraceful that he replaced one of the last scores that his father ever did, so... Anyway. Overall, the movie and book give audiences a down-to-earth look at a situation that we might never have even considered before. Contemporary reviews cite the film as changing the way teen-oriented films portray their struggles for the better. Film's casting directors Janet Hershenson and Jane Jenkins wrote in a 2007 book that the film's realistic portrayal of poor teenagers created a new kind of filmmaking, especially about teenagers, a more naturalistic look at how people talk, act, and experience the world. This movie was one of the few Hollywood offerings to deal realistically with kids from the wrong side of the tracks, and to portray honestly children whose parents had abused, neglected, or otherwise failed them. There's a lot of value in this, I think, given that many view the world as very black and white. That last line, discussing aspects that shape people into who they are specifically because they were failed, hits home. We are still living in a world where the actions and reactions of people who come before have failed us, and we are desperately clinging on to any kind of success and forward momentum. It can be hard to see the bigger picture, that we're all struggling no matter where we're sitting in life.
These heady ideas are simply not going to sit around in English classrooms or in film canisters, so in early 1989, an article went out stating that there was going to be a sequel to the movie in the works, and the sequel would eventually be shaped into a weekly television show, working as an expansion of the world set up by Hinton and Coppola. The show, titled The Outsiders, would premiere in March 1990 and run for only 13 episodes, before finishing in July that same year. The Outsiders was a mid-season replacement and had a short shelf life, but gave more to those who craved further adventures of the Curtis brothers and their friends. This program is the perfect place to see that, even if it isn't exactly perfect in its execution, something we are definitely going to get into. I didn't necessarily know there was an Outsiders TV show, so I kind of stumbled upon it by accident and it totally reignited my fixation on the IP. In preparation, I rewatched the movie with my roommate, then marathoned the show over the next couple of days, I took notes, and found that while I enjoyed many aspects of the show, there were some disappointments as well. And unlike my Life with Lucy video where we went episode by episode, we are going to break down the show by looking at each character and their arc throughout the series, starting with the Curtis brothers and working our way down. Most of my critiques come in the form of character stuff, not so much the storytelling or production values. It's going to be hard not to compare the series to the book and movie, but it's almost inevitable given how inexplicably linked they are. The series even begins with a short clip of Dallas's death at the end of the movie. How are we supposed to pretend that they aren't connected? We have to remember that the series is a continuation of the original story, meaning that inconsistencies in the characters are, perhaps, quirks and ideals we didn't have enough time to explore in the original text. So, when we run across those examples, I'll take the time to explain where this might have come from. Are we ready? Let's go. The first episode of the show was a 90-minute TV movie that sets a pony boy as the protagonist and narrator. The first scene shows a social worker coming to the house and establishing the stakes of the show. If Daryl is deemed unfit, or if Ponyboy is found in any kind of danger, he will be taken out of Daryl's care and placed in a foster home, something Pony doesn't like very much. Even though the court has awarded Daryl custody of you two, it's contingent on several things. Staying out of trouble, maintaining a decent home environment, and Ponyboy remaining in school. He anything. Even truancy could jeopardize your situation. Pony finds it hard to keep his head above water socially, as Cherry Valance doesn't so much as give him the time of day, and he keeps running into situations with the other greasers that cause outrage from the Soches. He and Daryl are at each other's throats, something that becomes kind of a staple character conflict. I can't stay out it's of- none of your business! It is my business! You keep telling me what to do! The scout's none of my business! Is Connie in you your business? Huh? We also see his compassionate side when he talks with a young girl out on the street, whom he nicknames Scout. You like to read? Yeah, why do you? I read books all the time. What's your name? Ain't my name. Well, what did they call you then? You don't need to call me anything. I'll be here long enough for it to matter. You ever read To Kill a Mockingbird? No. It's one of my favorite books. So what's that matter on you? I guess because you kind of reminded me of this character from the story, Scout. I always pictured her like you. Ponyboy is academic in a way that has never really been fostered before, shown here when he reads a composition aloud in class. It wasn't right. It wasn't neighborly. But I did feel better when I saw that they would make it to freedom. A funny thing how doing something so wrong can make you feel so good. I wondered what lie I could tell Colonel Kincaid when he came by, looking for his property. I was getting to where I could see the truth. Someday I'll be brave enough to speak it. He admits he's not very good at spelling, but the drive and creativity are definitely there to compensate. Many times, Pony is used as a catalyst in the action, either as secret keeper, as when Soda accidentally thinks he gets a girl pregnant and asks Pony not to tell Derry. You're gonna get rid of that baby, aren't you? It's not my fault. It's what the girl wants. 
or as a voice of reason, like when Derry hypocritically disavows Scout staying at their house to escape her abusive home when he's spending too much time with a lonely military wife. I had a great time. I don't know, such a good dance. <laughs> yeah, well, things weren't so great over here. Scout's father came and got her. He's a mean drunk, Derry. Pushed Soda down, tried to pick a fight. I warned you to stay out of her life. I can't stay out it's of none it. None of your business! It is my business! He often finds himself in the middle of moral quandaries, which fit his age pretty well. In one episode, while helping build a bridge, he catches the eye of a chain gang convict who later escapes. Desperate to remain uncaptured, he leans on Ponyboy to provide him with clothes, food, and shelter until he can make a clean getaway. Pony wrestles with telling Derry and Soda until Soda ends up getting shot in the shoulder by the man. There too is the episode where, during a storm, Pony and 2-Bit have to decide to either save themselves or help an injured Soch to safety. Coincidentally, their English class is delivering speeches on virtuous people from history, and Pony decides he would rather be like them and pulls the Soch to safety. Further, in my favorite episode of the series, Pony decides to help Scout out of her abusive family dynamic by offering her their couch. When her mother makes a scene at school, Pony visits a social worker who advises him that Scout make the move to secure a better life for herself. The best he can do is to take the verbal reprimands from her, as he knows that the decision needs to be hers and hers alone. Talk to him, Mrs. Hayes, about you. What did you do that for? Well, I thought maybe I could help. All she'd want to do is put me in a foster home. With what little growth there truly is in the series, this episode shows how much Pony has matured by series end. The episode, titled The Beat Goes On, is episode 12 of 13. As a back half tale, there's a lot to admire here. Pony sees a lot of himself in Scout and doesn't want to see her throw her life away in what could be an avoidable situation. She just doesn't know how to help herself, something he definitely struggled with in the film and earlier in the series. We've got no place to stay. Scout, I'll find you a place to stay, I promise you. Scout, you stay with us as long as you want. One of the more, let's say, controversial moves the series made was to have Ponyboy lose his virginity. Give me just half a second. <laughs> what the fuck? Now. It's not like it's anything gross or gratuitous, it's actually done quite sweetly, but it's an aspect of the show that expands the characters and their lives. Would I have chosen this as a plot for the show? Probably not. But it's what we have, so let's look at it. In episode 4, Breaking the Maiden, Pony, Derry, and Buck, the owner of the local bar and auto shop where Soda, Steve, and 2-Bit work, go on a camping trip. This is after Pony had an offer to go to the school dance with Cherry, but is swooped head over ass with his brother to go to the annual camping trip. At the lodge, Pony is hit on by another person there camping, who wants to meet him that night to dance. They do, and the two end up sleeping together. She is a great few years older than Ponyboy, but she doesn't seem to mind. Ponyboy adds sex to his list of life experiences and moves on. As icky as this could have been, and it kind of is, thinking about it, as a coming of age show, it kind of fits right in. We would see the characters in 1995's My So-Called Life dealing with similar things only five years later, so I don't think it was a far cry to see our Ponyboy step towards manhood. In the final episode, Pony is recruited to tutor a track star, Randy, and he gets to see how the other half lives. Is Randy here? I'm a friend of his from school. Ponyboy Curtis? This, uh, this is the Addison house, isn't it? Randy? Cool boy is here. Initially reluctant, he finds that the connections he makes are valuable. Randy's grandmother proves to be prejudiced, but Randy's father takes a liking to him. Randy, in a jealous rage, tells Pony that his father is only now using Pony Boy for clout, as Randy can now get into an Ivy League college. Why shouldn't I believe him? He's using you. Can you see that? I mean, he would have said anything to keep you here. Because he wants you to pass the test. What's wrong with that? What he wants? Well, what about what I want? Doesn't that count at all? Well, sure it does, but he's your father. Yeah, right, he's my father. You know, the only thing he cares about is bragging to his drinking buddies about how I'm gonna be on the Olympics. This prompts the question, 
Would Pony Boy be able to get into an Ivy League college if he had the same privilege as Randy? The social inability to climb to bigger and better things rests on Pony Boy's shoulders, as Derry and Soda have decided to settle into their ways. At least, most of the time. Pony's arc throughout the show is that of maturation, and breaking the cycle. He is the hope for the Curtis brothers to go out into the world and really do something with himself. Of course, he feels this position deeply, sometimes wishing he didn't have all the pressure they put on him. And in comparing him to C. Thomas Howell's version of the character, I would say J.R. Ferguson gives Pony a lighter feel overall, someone who is more aware of his surroundings, but isn't afraid to call out his brothers on their hypocrisy. This reads as more emotionally intelligent, especially towards the end of the series. Look at this mess I got myself into. What a dope I am. Soda Pop Curtis, as originally written, is the handsome middle brother who plays mediator to Derry and Ponyboy's disagreements, often taking them down and joking that when things get too heavy. The series, I think, does Soda pretty dirty. Instead of a character who had the wherewithal to speak with both his brothers at their own level, we instead find someone who is pretty, but stupid, a big eater, and an impulsive and indulgent young man. Admittedly, Soda doesn't do much in the first episode, but he does get the spotlight pretty much right away in the second episode, The Stork Club. You never know, personality counts too. I don't care, but anyhow. Soda is told he's gotten his most recent fling pregnant. The girl, played by a young Patricia Arquette, believes the baby to be his, but the father is really a so she had been seeing as well. You slept with me once and you told me it meant something. And the next day you froze me out like I wasn't even alive. At least Brian... At least Brian what? Did he pawn his mom's ring? Did he? Tell me! Soda, really ready to bear the brunt of fatherhood, was willing to help pay for the baby. Abortion was even discussed as an option. You're gonna get rid of that baby, aren't you? It's not my fault! It's what the girl wants! Those operations, aren't they dangerous? She says she knows a doctor. Who? I don't know, Pony! You're just a kid! You don't understand these things! Soda is pretty good here, all things considered, but his one misstep is not telling Derry about a situation, wanting to solve it himself. Soda is seen with a few girls throughout the series, which is kind of a letdown considering he wanted to date his steady, Sandy, in the movie. It's not that I hate this change, I really don't, but it reinforces something about Soda's personality that was relatively underplayed before, that his good looks are more of a curse than a blessing. Very few plots in The Outsiders revolve around relationships, but Soda is probably pulling the most girls throughout the show. He is naturally very flirtatious, and people are just drawn to him, not only because of his words, but his good looks, too. His features get him into trouble later in the series, in the episode Winner Takes All, where he enters a contest to be a cover model. He doesn't get it, but 2-Bit and Steve send him a letter claiming that he had. On a high, he decides to use the prize money, which he hadn't yet received, to get Derry an early birthday present. Buck lends him his credit card, and Soda goes on a rather large shopping spree, rationalizing that he'll have the money come that Monday. I can even let you have it for less than what we're advertising for. I'll take it! Great. Would that be cash or charge? <laughs> charge. Excellent. Derry is furious, claiming he shouldn't buy anything until he has the real money to back his purchase. Soda, only thinking of his brother's happiness and the chance to have a nicer looking home, decides to return the things he bought. Being a tad naive is one thing, sure, but going rogue with another person's credit card is quite another. I sold my cell phone believing that telegram. Don't worry about it. I started wanting to believe just as much as you. One of Soda's lesser scrapes comes when he gets shot by the escaped criminal mentioned earlier. To keep Pony out of the line of fire, Soda is the one to deliver clothes and food to the prisoner who shoots him in the shoulder. We don't really follow up on this plot thread, but it's nice to see Soda doing something for his brother to keep him from danger. This feeling might be short-lived as we go into the worst Soda plot in the show. Mmm, in the episode Mirror Image, Soda is dating a girl who suddenly gets the hots for another student. The student, new to the area, happens to be black. He listens to me. Only not like you, Soda. Only concerned about yourself. He cares about me. How I feel. He cares about getting in your pants is all. Jealous, Soda gets some other students to jump him. This sets off a chain reaction of harassment, not only for the black student, but Ponyboy and Soda himself. Clothes? Jeez, if I were you, I would be careful. I hear there's a nasty flu going around. <laughs> well, what do you know? A matching set. 
Even though Soda didn't actively participate in the assault, he is still complicit as a bystander. This is an interesting way to take Soda's character, but definitely not the best take. At best, Soda is an ignorant buffoon, but at worst, he's a racist aggressor. The worst character derailment happens with Soda Pop Curtis, so much that it was disheartening to watch. Even though he learns from his mistakes, like in the pregnancy episode, there are other moments that paint a picture of a young man who was either naive or flat out malicious. His actions are pretty much inexcusable in Mirror Image. As you know, man, Sarah Jane called. You gotta thank her sometime. Guess that means we're still rivals, huh? There are also a few other minor things, such as him trying to win money at a poker game during the Storm episode, or when he separated from a client's car when he, Steven, 2-bit ditch work to go to a carnival. Soda's character walks a fine line between childhood and manhood, so it makes his actions seem all the more outrageous. One roll of the dice, the one is the fortune. It happens all the time. He's definitely an impulsive person, as shown with a credit card scandal but he's shown to do the right thing, like with the pregnancy plot. Characters need to have flaws to be interesting, but I think mining Soda's insecurities might have been a better fit. For example, there could have been an episode where, after helping Pony with his homework, he decides to re-enroll in school, only to find that it's been too long and he doesn't want to compete with Pony for grades, and now he's needed to financially help out of the house. Or, Soda becomes too close with Steve's latest girlfriend, and Steve gets jealous. Okay, those are two rough ideas, but I... I, I don't know, man. I think they might have had more credence than what we got. And now, to cleanse our palate, here's a scene of Soda as the beautiful voice of reason that he is. From the movie. Jerry could put you in a boy's home. Worked his way through college. I'm telling you the truth, Pony. But you don't want to be like me anyway. Because I'm happy working at a gas station. Never be happy doing something like that. Terry, you gotta stop yelling at him for every little thing that he does, man. I mean, he, he feels things differently than you. Bad enough having to, to listen to you. When you, when you start trying to get me to take sides, we're all we got left now. So please, don't fight anymore, please. Sure, sure little buddy, we ain't gonna fight no more. Well sure, I understand that, but how I take pride in my work, nobody wants a leaky roof, what's the point? Daryl Derry Curtis is the oldest brother and, well, he likes roofs. I'm in the roofing business. If this wind gets any worse, we'll have to use them to nail down this roof. Everybody needs a roof. Like the majority of his appearances have to do with roofs, or roof building, or business about roofs, or business about roof building, or a roof building business. The point is, there's a lot to do with roofs, which is something only really mentioned in passing in the original text. There are other aspects to his character too, such as his stubbornness towards Ponyboy, which is really more of a reflection of himself. See, back in the day before the Curtis parents died, Derry was a successful student, but was forced to drop out to help raise Soda and Pony. This is hinted at in the first episode, where an old high school friend offers Derry a job building roofs with his father's construction company, and Soda remarks that Derry used to play football with him. Hey Derry, isn't that the guy I used to play football with in high school? Yeah, he quit. I'd have given up both knees to get to college and he quit. Derry is, like Pony Boy, a dreamer, but has been stomped back down to reality more than once enough to ensure that his disdain can come out towards Ponyboy. He sees a lot of himself in his brother, and will make sure that he doesn't make the same mistakes as him. In the novel, Derry chastises Pony for staying out late, and not thinking, something I can imagine his father might have done with him, but in a gentler kind of way. But you're living in a vacuum, Pony, and you're gonna have to cut it out. Just don't stop living because you lose somebody. Derry, unable to rationalize how to parent, as he's only ever been Ponyboy's brother, grows hostile when Pony doesn't learn his lessons the same way that he did. As Pony's guardian, he is walking on eggshells when it comes to the social worker who visits them in the pilot episode. Curtis resident? Yeah? I'm Barbara Richards, Department of Welfare. I believe we have a nine o'clock appointment. Could you wait a second? What time did you say it was? 
Welfare guy was going to be here. The first scene shows the house in relative disarray, nothing that would be read as neglectful, but Derry feels his position as guardian very deeply, even if he doesn't show it. His passion comes about through anger and hostility, which Pony pushes back against, and Soda steps in to help moderate. It's not a healthy dynamic, but it works for them, I suppose. Because of his status not only as guardian, but brother, there are moments where Soda and Pony refuse or neglect to tell Derry things in order to stay out of trouble or fix it themselves. See the Soda Pregnancy episode and the Chain Gang episode. I'm not gonna tell Derry, neither are you. Talk to me. I can't. Why can't you? What's going on, Pony? But there are others where the boys step up to the plate and work together. In episode 6, Maybe Baby, an old friend of Derry's is searching for a job, leaving the Curtis clan in charge of watching his months-old infant. When he doesn't return, the brothers decide to buy baby supplies and make her more comfortable. Derry, especially, grows angry that anyone would want to abandon their child. It's very awkward when the friend returns to take the baby on the road with him as he doesn't have permanent residence. Time to say goodbye. This is flipped on its head, however, in the previously mentioned The Beat Goes On, where Derry is annoyed by Scout's constant presence at their house. That's terrible, Derry being naked in front of a little girl. <laughs> what is she doing here? I don't know. Our folks are probably fighting again. While he was previously flabbergasted by parental neglect, he is now wishing the abused girl to go back home. Meanwhile, he is entertaining a lonely military wife by taking her dancing and spending time with her. The boys argue that, if he isn't home to step over Scout, then what's the point in making her leave? In his most constant arc, Derry dreams of owning a roofing business, much like their father did. He doesn't have enough collateral for the bank, so he has to settle for working for others until he can afford the loan to develop the business. While struggling to find work, he joins up with a group of laborers, unbeknownst that they are a group of scabs on the opposite side of a picket line Tim Shepard is on. More on him later. Derry's character is really the one of the boys that's the most consistent. He constantly has the same goals, upholds the same values, and works as the aggressive voice of reason 95% of the time. I didn't much like Derry in the original, so seeing how strong and consistent he was in the series was really something to behold. But now, we're going to dive into some characters that got very little time in the spotlight in the novel and movie. We'll start with 2-Bit Matthews. What about my roof? I notice your roof is in need of repair, and I'm a licensed roofer, and I can offer you a very good price. Tell me more, big boy. Originally played by Emilio Estevez, 2-Bit was a pretty aloof character until the TV show. His only plot thing to begin with was taking Ponyboy to the hospital to see Dallas and Johnny, and giving Pony the moment to tell him that people are alike all over. Not a ton to work with there. In the show, however, 2-Bit ended up as one of my favorites. Played by David Arquette, he doesn't have a lot to do at first, only really showing Pony that his new job at the bowling alley is perfect for being a peeping Tom. Yeah but gradually grows into his own. About midway through the season, in Maybe Baby, 2-Bit decides to get in touch with his estranged biological father, who is, by all definitions, a Soch. I suppose she told you all sorts of horrible things about me. One of the best. To trash. Chandler Nichols, her name. She took off to some other state, left Mama and me to fend for ourselves. Do you believe that now? that I'm trash, that I ran off to another state. Upon learning about his father and stepbrother, 2-Bit is stricken by how much he resents his life and how he could have been living. His home life now, with a drunken, abusive father who tells him he can't read, isn't exactly ideal. My father, the coward. You think I'm a loser? You can hardly write your name. You can barely read. 2-Bit chooses not to stay too close to his father, deciding that the life he lives now will be fine once he's able to gain his own footing. The whole episode is really touching and melancholic. Maybe if you're not such a bad guy, I'm not such a bad guy either. 2-Bit is shown to have extensive knowledge of auto mechanics, working at the auto shop with Soda and Steve. He isn't very smart in school, having repeated 10th grade three times. I guess this means he's determined to stay in school, but I can't say that without any actual proof. He is known to be a bit of a prankster, as shown in Winner Takes All when he and Steve forge a contest winning letter to Soda. Hey, it's getting a little crazy, let's tell him. No, 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 we'll tell him in the morning. Let's not burst this bubble right now. 
Let's have him have a big night, okay? He is also a somewhat skilled musician, as seen in the episode Only the Lonely. Some of the greasers form a cover band who play at the school dance. They are popular with the students, but this doesn't really go anywhere after this episode. No, I'll win them over. Just me and the king up there on the stage looking down on all them wean social kids. Oh, we're the North Side Greaser Band. We can do anything. <laughs> Don't you forget that. That's right. In his second Spotlight episode, Tequila Sunset, his gambling debts begin piling up, leading him to leaning on the star basketball player to commit a foul to make up the money. About tonight, what would you do if you were me? I'd win the game. He is desperate for this to work itself out, but the player has too much integrity in the game to purposely throw it. He takes it all in stride with his usual two-bit bits, but the stakes in this particular episode are quite high, more so than others. That's what makes this episode very strong, that the jokiest one of the group has something to lose despite what he tells everyone. He's able to put on a big facade by joking about his troubles when, in reality, he's the most troubled of all. I thought the gambling would bring me in the quick money. I thought if I drank I wouldn't be so scared all the time. I don't belong anywhere, Soda. I don't belong anywhere. And I don't have anyone to belong to. I loved Arquette's portrayal of 2-Bit, probably more than Estevez, which really isn't fair because he gets more screen time in the show. What we get is an insecure young man who is eager to make something of himself, but simply doesn't have the tools to get him there. Not just yet. But you see, whooping you right now be just too easy. I want you and all the rest of your little jockstrap friends. Tim Shepard is the most elusive of the greasers, and probably the one I was most eager to learn about as the series progressed. Originally a neutral party in the gang of greasers, Tim is a main character in the show. He essentially replaces Dallas as the resident troublemaker and lawless type. In his first appearance, he soaks someone with a coke they ordered and proceeds to mouth off to a policeman who unfairly pulled them over. Hell, we weren't going any faster than they were. Truth be told, the cops in this universe are very biased when it comes to who they prosecute. Tim has a troubled home life, as they all do. His mother is very cold to him, not even accepting his monetary gift when he returns home from prison. His attempts to turn his life around are continually thwarted by the ease of returning to the dark side, where his ties are stronger and his character is more deeply rooted. In one episode, while attempting to go straight and get a job, his mob friends persuade him to take on one last job. Just don't know it yet. Whatever you say, man. Tim gets put in jail early on in the show, and is actually gone for an episode before returning. When he does, he strikes up an on-again, off-again relationship with Cherry Valance. This pairing, no doubt, stems from a line from the original, where Cherry states she'd fall in love with Dallas if she ever saw him again. And, seeing as Tim is the replacement for Dallas in the show, we can see where this is going. Attention. Ooh, serious business. Wouldn't want you to fall into a life of crime. Maybe I ought to give you a lift. Admittedly, this is also the most interesting dynamic in the show, as we see the two really do have chemistry. She's put off by his brutishness, and he's charmed by her willingness to talk with him, to actually relate to him. I saw you back there a few minutes ago. What'd you do, quit your job? What job? In the diner. Give the man his apron back. Oh, he must have got me mixed up with someone else. I don't wear aprons. Tim is also a very persuasive person, even to the point of driving a wedge between the Curtis brothers. In the episode where he returns, Tim gives Soda some bad advice and ends up alienating him from Derry for a bit. Don't ever let him see you sweat. Got that? Because when you do, they walk all over you. You right, man? Because of reputation, even when he does nothing wrong, he can still get blamed for criminal activity. In the Escaped Convict episode, after Soda is shot, both the police and Derry believe it was Tim who shot Soda instead of the far-fetched tale Pony shares with them. How did it happen? That escape con you liked so much. Are you saying you didn't know? Of course I didn't know. It seems more plausible for someone who was recently released from prison to have maimed someone than the literal missing convict. The Outsiders really said A-cab. 
In Tim's most down-to-earth plot, he decides to see the girl who got away. When he meets up with her, he discovers she now has it very well. She's married a Soch, lives in a house in a nice part of town, and goes to church. When he invites himself to worship on Sunday, he inadvertently embarrasses her, despite the fact they both came from the same place. She explains that she's been able to pick herself up and dust herself off, and become the girl she's always envied in school. I'm glad I'm not traveling in your direction. You are. Never will. The cycle of societal descent is more prevalent in Tim Shepard's story, and it makes him one of the most sympathetic characters, as well as the most interesting. When he's played with heart, it's truly something special. Tim's expansion in the TV series is one of its best aspects. I hate dress. Anyway, last time I went to the dance, the only one who danced with me was you, and I had to ask you. Scout is the Johnny Cade replacement for the series, but there's more to her than this pale comparison. For one, despite her abusive home life, we see that truly she is very smart, understanding Pony's literary references when they talk for the first time. Same book. Yeah, real sad. No time for sergeants. Okay, so a data sent book. She just has no way to express herself, as, and is continually defensive when someone tries to confront her about her aloofness. She's also not one to sit back and let the guys do the work. More than once, she's seen helping at the auto shop with Soda and 2-Bit. She's also the manager of the Northside Greaser Band, even though that lasts for only one episode. Out there and meet someone to so get Cherry, she's the queen. She can't, she's getting her hair done. So? So I'm asking, will you please come out there and help us rehearse? The longest thread through her appearances is her potential crush on Pony Boy and his obliviousness to it. Whether this is due to his pet name for her, he's the one that coins the nickname Scout, or the fact that they are closer in age than the rest of the characters, I'm not sure. Early in the series, Scout is invited to a Soch party and Pony is apprehensive about her going, claiming she's only invited so others will make fun of her. When she shows up in nice clothes and the Soch boy tries to kiss her, she gets embarrassed and leaves. I mean special. Other than little hints here and there, Scout's attraction to Pony winds down towards the end of the show. Their maturity levels can almost be seen to match one another, as Pony is the mentor to Scout, who is at a similar place he was at the beginning of the original story. They even talk about a sunset, just like he and Johnny did. So dawn goes down today. Nothing gold can stay. I never knew anybody else liked to watch sunsets. What's the matter, Scout? I never let myself have many friends before. I move around too much. There are many times where Scout is MIA, and she's only there for about half of the episodes. I'm not a Scout purist or anything, but sometimes hearing her perspective could have been interesting. Somehow though, her being missing isn't a problem. It adds a lot to the mystery of her character, and this is explained in her spotlight episode, The Beat Goes On, where we learn her parents are neglectful and abusive. She's nearly smacked in the hallway in front of the student body, but is shown mercy by her mother in the end. Her mother clearly cares for her, but cannot end the cycle of abuse wrought on by her husband. Linda's not at your house? No, ma'am. Holly! Uh, find her. Look for her. Right now! Get over here! Without her family dynamic, though, I'm not sure where Scout's character would have gone. The background information we were missing for so long made her interesting, but once revealed, the writers played their cards. I can imagine, in an alternate world where we got a season 2, there could be a plot where Scout and Ponyboy date to make Cherry jealous or something menial like that. I really wanted to see Scout grow and overcome her circumstances, so her spotlight coming so late in the series was almost like a triumph. It didn't really reveal anything groundbreaking, but I appreciate the writer's willingness to show that even the meekest among us can rise above the circumstances placed upon us. I hate it when they ask me, so what college are you going to? What do you plan on doing? Like, I have it all planned out. 
Cherry Valance is the Soch with the most screen time, and honestly, I have little to say about her. Initially cold to Ponyboy, she warms up to being seen with him around her friends. Like, literally, she gives him the cold shoulder in one of the first scenes. Then she, Marsha, and Ponyboy are talking like old friends in one of the last episodes. When Pony is simping for her, she's actively deflecting Tim Shepard's advances. She's flustered a lot by Tim's ways, but all the while finds him alluring. She's seen at the stables many times, even almost influencing Soda to buy a horse when he's on his crazed spending spree. It's been a long time since I've been near horses. Being around horses always gave me the feeling of being free. Whatever happened to the horse? One Saturday afternoon, I went down to the stables with my dad, and the stall was empty. You know, Soda, if you're serious about buying a horse, you should go over to bar number three. Ask for Frank Roberts. I initially thought P Cherry was going to exploit Pony's feelings for her, and this isn't entirely untrue. In the Storm episode, Pony has written a speech for her, and she takes it sight unseen, realizing the perspective he's written from isn't one she had ever considered before. She reacts in the moment to the words that she's saying, and it's pretty great. Benjamin Franklin was not only well known for taking baths in the wind, he was, most of us know, famous for his inventions and discoveries like electricity and for the books he wrote and for helping our country become free. But to me, what is most important about Ben Franklin is that he believed in being loyal to his friends. It didn't matter if they were rich or poor. It didn't matter how many people talked behind his back about the kinds of friends he had. If you were his friend, you were always his friend. Today, we'd probably laugh at his wig and funny pants and socks. But we'd also know he was a greaser from Boston who never forgot where he came from, who his friends were, even when he became a social in London, Paris, or Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. She definitely has sympathy for the plight of the greasers. We don't get any kind of monologues from her about how hard it is to have it so good, which I find is an improvement on the source material. She's committed, to all else, to be a good student and to get out of town once she's in college. Other than a few more minor appearances, Cherry's impact in the series is very minor, which ended up being disappointing. She could have been a decent, dramatic figure, especially if she were to get further mixed up in Tim's life, or had to be paired with another one of the greasers for whatever reason. More interaction with characters other than Tim and and Pony would have done her well, but we will just have to settle for what could have been. I've hit all the major players in the series, but there are a few minor characters worth mentioning. First is Steve Randall, the only one of the Greaser Boys not to get a spotlight episode, let alone a subplot. This was also the case in the original story. Steve's biggest plot contribution is when he and 2-Bit forge a contest letter to Soda and have to talk sense into him. And when I get that check on Monday or Tuesday, I'm gonna pay you back, Buck, I promise. Look, Soda will help you pick it all back right now, okay? Yeah, that's a good idea, Steve. Otherwise, Steve is often seen in the background or will occasionally have one line to say that's a reaction to something else. He works with Soda and 2-Bit at the auto shop. I feel that, in a season 2, it would have gotten more stories about him. Buck is the owner of the auto shop and the bar the characters frequent. He's played by Billy Bob Thornton, pre-Sling Blade. He's closest to Derry as they are closest in age. He has a good head on his shoulders, good enough to own two successful businesses. He can play down the boys' level, but he isn't afraid to set them straight when they screw up. His best moment is here, when he leads Derry out of the lodge so Ponyboy can make his move. Well, like, like Derry said, um, fishing comes mighty early. Honey boy, remember I was telling you about all those interesting people who come in here? Why don't you stay a while? Uh, well, I'm not that much of a dancer. There's nothing to it, Pony boy. You just lead with your left. We'll see you back at camp, Ponyboy. Randy is another so who is kind of friends with Ponyboy. He's obviously rich, but this doesn't keep him from interacting with Ponyboy or beefing with 2-Bit. Hey, 2-Bit, if trouble's following you around, don't try and bring your friends down with you. You got this. That makes you the lucky one. You know, you can get out of here. You might even go to college. To me, basketball's like everything else. You know, I like school, I like work. You gotta want to get in the game. And then when you do, you play to win. Pony is the impressionable one of the greasers, so being able to see both sides of society without much jadedness aids in his relationship with Randy. But Randy shows a cruel side when he tells Pony his father is just using his tutoring to give Randy clout for attending an Ivy League school. An arc about closing the friendship gap between Randy and 2-Bit would be on my wish list. 
Marcia is Cherry's friend, and I'll sum her up in one sentence. She is the confidant and reasonable one in the group, often making a sly remark or encouraging others to continue with their defined plot thing for the episode and dipping after her one scene is over. That's Marcia. And lastly, Leonardo DiCaprio is the one kid that fights Scout in the first episode. No joke. Is The Outsiders a good show? I wouldn't go that far. I would say it's an intriguing show with plenty of good ideas in it. However, the show is far too episodic for its own good, leading to fragmented characterization that makes it hard to watch week to week. I want these characters to grow and change from event to event, not reset at the end of an hour. Almost all have well-defined traits that follow them around like a shadow, stunting any and all forward momentum their arcs could have given them. This is a byproduct of the era when the show was born, where overarching plots were delegated to soap operas. Producers didn't necessarily want groundbreaking and complicated plots at a time when home media for TV shows was scarce, and only one or two episodes could fit on a VHS. Episodic TV shows are also easier to show in syndication, so they could be aired out of order. The Outsiders was only shown in syndication once. Maybe. It's rumored that one episode was shown on TV land in the early 2000s. The show has never had a commercial release, so the footage used in this video is all from contemporary recordings. It's a shame the show following up such a cultural milestone like the original novel faded into such obscurity. The show was killed before it could become something special, and more than just its initial premise. I might not have known there was an Outsiders TV show before falling down this rabbit hole, but I'm appreciative I could revisit media from such a formative time in my life. The images burned into my mind of sunsets, male tenderness, and yes, even Rob Lowe in a towel, have stuck with me long after I'd forgotten about them. Every few years or so, I may rewatch The Outsiders, polishing these memories so they too can stay forever gold. Shirt somewhere? Hey, you gotta wear no. a mask, too, buddy. That's a dick.